Hello and welcome to the 1875 podcast. I'm your host, Tom Schofield, and today I'm joined by Jonathan Secker, Ryan Hildred and Luke Kimberly in a transfer extravaganza. There is, of course, the added bonus that you get to see our beautiful faces and, of course, Ryan's garage. It was a bit of a mental deadline day, really, and throughout this podcast, we'll speak about each individual signing. First up, though, I want each of our guests on the panel today to sum up the transfer window in one sentence. First off, Jonathan, I'm going to come to you with this one. OK, that's in a sentence, I'd say it's, well, the best window for a, a while, where we improved where we needed to and kept all the key players. I think you're spot on there, to be, to be honest. Uh, Ryan, in, in a sentence? Uh, in a sentence, we've added some much-needed squad depth. I like it. And Luke, in a sentence. Um, made use of what we've got. Grown. Um, exciting. Mowbray's obviously got a plan. He's got a, a vision and we're moving with it. Again, I like all three. Nice and concise. Clear. Um, and three different things as well, I think. that Ryan, I want to come to you first, actually. I think you mentioned squad depth just then. And... In particular, the goalkeeping department, would you say? There's been a lot of, a bit of a rebuild, really, hasn't there? Um, obviously, three new keepers brought in. We basically had no senior keeper. Um, would you say the goalkeeping rebuild has, has contributed massively to that squad depth? Yeah, I think so. I think if you look at last season, we've obviously got a keeper on loan from a Premier League club. And then we've got Lutweiler, who, you know, the biggest unkept secret was, you know, he wasn't good enough for the championship. So you've got two keepers there that long term, you know, we're not going to keep. Uh, if you look at what Mowbray's now done, we've got Kaminsky, who on paper has got some Europa League experience and in and around that Belgium squad. So seems already tailor made for the championship and made a solid start for us. Ainsley Pears, you know, I spoke to a Middlesbrough fan the other day about, you know, him. He is a goalkeeper who I think under Mowbray should develop into a really good goalkeeper for us and will challenge Kaminsky for that position, unlike Lutweiler with Walton last season, for example. And then, you know, the ace in the pack, Sergiakis, who knows how good he's going to be, you know, highly rated, of course, but, um, you know, he could really turn into a good one as well. So just looks like we're really solid in that, that goalkeeping department now. Certainly does. And Luke, Ryan mentioned just then Stergiakis. Now, he's a bit of an unknown. And like he said, we don't know how good he's going to be. Um, but when you look at it, it's that European scouting network that is surely paying dividends. How, how good is it to say that that's the case in the goalkeeping department? With two, actually, because Kaminsky as well. I mean, absolutely. Um, European scouting markets um, paid dividends, hasn't it, for, for clubs like Norwich in the past? Um the fact that we hadn't tapped that market previously, um, we, we, we didn't know. It, so it was an unknown. Um, and we're following Norwich now with their successes. Like you say, Stergiakis, what's, it, what's he going to bring? He made his debut for um, Slavia Sofia at 17. He's, he's a big, big boy in here at six foot five. Um, 78 appearances already um, for, uh, for Slavia. He's, he's, he's clearly, like, like you said, Ryan, he's, he's clearly an exciting prospect. Um, he's going to push Kaminsky. Let's say Kaminsky is another one from that European um, scouting network, let's say. Let's hope it pays. Um, when you're talking about goalkeepers, obviously, Ainsley Purs, again, he's only going to challenge. He's only going to kick these boys on. Uh, we've got an experienced keeper and we've got this this youngster with three keepers. Um it's, we've got strength in depth, haven't we? Um, European and, and domestic. So let's let's see. It's, it's exciting, absolutely. Jonathan, obviously, both Ryan um, and Luke have both mentioned Ainsley Pears there. Were you quite shocked that we went in for him? Because obviously he had been rumoured at one point and then it sort of went a bit cold, didn't it? We signed um, Steriakis and that was seen as the number two. He was the number two keeper, given his pedigree. Um, were you shocked that we went back in for Ainsley Pears on deadline day? A little bit. I, th I think I was possibly, uh, the flip side to that, a little bit more shocked that Pears was so keen to, to, to push through the move. And uh, I don't know if anyone saw, but there was something that Warnock come out with and said basically he was doing his head in, so he wanted to get get rid of him. And from, from Pears' perspective, he had quite a good taste of... Um, 
first team football at Middlesbrough last year. So he must really sort of rate himself, fancy himself to want to be number one. And I can't, I, you just can't see him being number one for us straight away. But obviously it's still still a good good addition. And I, I echo everything that Ryan and Luke have said. For me, a couple of the, the key points behind it is that we own all these players now. They are ours. They're our, our property. Potentially a, a lot of them have got a good sell-on value if the point in time comes. And actually the outlay we had for both Kaminsky, Pears and and the Greek uh, it was was minimal, wasn't it? I think we're talking less less than a million on all three of them, which is is really really good business, isn't it? It does show that actually that European market does really give us opportunities for value for money. It definitely does, and I think, like I said, the outlay is the most impressive thing there. That you've got on a goalkeeper that was number one at Ghent. You got a goalkeeper that for a time was number one at um, Middlesbrough. And a goalkeeper that was number one at Slavia Sofia. Obviously, the pedigree of those clubs differs, um, but these are still people that have had first team football uh, recently. Uh, Ryan, I want to um, come back to you. You mentioned that you spoke to a Middlesbrough fan about pairs. What did he have to say about him? Was he disappointed they'd lost him, or was it a case of it doesn't really matter? It's not that big of an impact. Mm. I think they were quite disappointed to lose him because he's a Middlesbrough lad and I think his dad played in the same side as Tony Mowbray. So just another one of those that have come through that that Middlesbrough academy uh, and whatever. But um, I think ultimately they understood it because Neil Warnock loves a big goalkeeper, one with a bit of presence, and they've signed Bettinelli now who fits that mould. So I think it was just a case of Warnock not fancying Ainsley pairs and they can understand why he's gone. Um, I think they're looking at it that They have got Bettinelli, yes, but I don't think they're like us where they've got potentially a a strong understudy. So maybe they've left themselves a little bit exposed there. But again, a keeper of 22 years old, I think the overwhelming feeling from them was, you know, can we not just keep him a bit longer and and develop him? But I think it was just a case of three things all aligning. You know, Rovers offering a bit of a price, Warnock not fancying him, and then Pears obviously fancying the move to us. So I think those three things really just combined together and, and led to the deal. So I think it's a more interesting move than I probably give it credit for. I wasn't particularly aware that it was something that he was pushing through. It shows the terrible research I've done, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it wasn't something that I was fully aware of. So it's an interesting move. Like you say, Kaminsky's had a great start to life at Rovers and I think pairs coming in, how much of a, how much of a threat is he going to be to that position? You'd hope that it's going to be a case of Kaminsky's not up to scratch like at times Bolton wasn't last season. You've got ready-made replacements to come in and, and really put pressure on him. And it obviously drives him to, to keep up the solid performances. Um, so moving on from goalkeepers, defenders are coming. That was something that Mowbray said last summer. And we brought in Tosin Adrabayo on loan. And that was basically it. Obviously, Muldrew went out on loan as well. Um, Luke, I'm going to throw this one to you. We obviously brought in Ayala and Douglas. Mm. Ayala is something of a coup, obviously promoted with Middlesbrough. Um, Are you happy that we've got a big name in? Because I know it goes without saying Adarabayo, as good as he was, he wasn't exactly a big name. People knew him from a a report in the Daily Mail, I think it was, about him buying a house. Um, That wasn't necessarily a positive article on the Mail's part, whether that's well, it is wrong, isn't it? Let's face it. Um, but the Isle's a big name. He's a huge name that, that in the championship, he's a stalwart of the league. Um, are you glad that it's a well-known name and it's not some unknown player? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when Ayala's name are getting thrown about, um, you're, you're almost daring to dream, aren't you? Thinking, are we, are we going to get a player of that calibre? He was linked with big money moves at, uh, you know, during his time at Middlesbrough. Helped him to to promotion in 2016. Um, been there for, I think, seven years now, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in fact, I think he even played under Mark Venus for three games back in 2013. So that's obviously where the links come in. I think Mowbray was interested in, in him even back then. Um, and then Venus obviously took him on when he was caretaker manager and, and he played them three games. Um, I think the only thing for me is he hasn't played up until coming to Rovers, I hadn't played until I think it was first of January when when he had a pretty bad ankle injury coming back from that. So that was that was my only concern really when we did sign him. But he's looked every part the player that we hope 
we'll hope that he will be um, in these first few games that he's played. Fantastic, really, and I'm just hoping that he's going to form quite a solid partnership with um, with Lenian. And I think going back to the keepers, really, it's only going to build confidence in those two guys when they've got you know a stalwart keeper behind them as well. So you know, fingers crossed on that part. But yeah, great coup. He did look to deal on on the Saturday. He looked to deal with Lewis Crabham really well. Obviously, they come to lose that game yeah. and didn't keep the clean sheet. But he marshaled him well, and he didn't seem to be bothered by him, which is. Obviously, Graben is another one that's seemed to score goals for fun in this league um, historically. So to, to have dealt with him relatively easily is obviously encouraging. Um, Jonathan, obviously there was the with the Ayala move, there was a bit of uncertainty as to whether it would come off. Do you have any concerns about that? Because obviously it seemed that the reason he wasn't going to come was because. He wanted to move abroad. I think it was Saudi Arabia or somewhere like that to, to earn, obviously, a big paycheck. Um, do you think that's being a bit harsh to him or are the concerns there that perhaps we do need to be careful because there was a point where he wasn't coming because there was potential to earn more money? Um, I'd probably say it's a touch harsh, to be honest, purely for the, the fact of we... We probably don't know the full story, really. There's that obviously that part of it did come up in um, in the media, which people are always play in a bit more. I remember at the the start of the summer, I'm sure he was heavily linked with Swansea as well, and there was a lot about his wages at that point. So I could never sort of see it see it happening. So no, I'm I'm, I'm more more positive on it. I think he's he's bought into what Mowbray wants, and we can't forget how sort of relaxed and sort of open and genuine Mowbray is as a manager. There's numerous times where we've had transfers, I think back to Stuart Down in Tosin as well, where they did take a long time to get over the line. And Mowbray was always relaxed, honest. And I think the players sort of see those key characteristics in him and, and do do ultimately make the make the right decision. I think Ayala is a really good signing because as good as Tosin was, the the stats don't lie. And in, in the last two seasons in championship, what we conceded, I think 64 and 60 goals. And there's there's no chance that we're that we're going to get promoted conceding that that amount of goals. So if we do have to go back to basics and just have two rugged centre half, and so be it. Watching the Preston Cardiff game yesterday, Sean Morrison was amazing. Puts his body on the line for everything. Would literally die for a for a clean sheet, wouldn't he? And um, I actually think is that we have actually as a team defended really well. And as much as this season, as much as we say how well Kaminsky's done, credit to the whole defence for actually protecting him quite well, actually, and, and really sort of limiting the number of shots he's faced. I think that's a fair point, because obviously he's had one or two probably flashy saves, but he's not particularly been troubled massively in any of the games. Obviously, the Bournemouth game, all three goals conceded were genuine, very good goals. Um, obviously, made that one great save in that game. So I think it's a fair point that obviously... The defence have come in, and that includes Derek Williams and Lennon, as you say. Um, and both of them have really been been pretty solid. Um, Ryan, was anything said about Ayala um, with the, with the Middlesbrough fan? Was that something that they were disappointed? Because obviously, he was a bit of a he's a bit of a legend there, isn't he? Yeah, um, they had nothing but good words to say about him. Um, obviously, was there for seven years. You were right, Luke. Um, <clears throat> I think it was just another one of those that it, it just reached the end of his time. Um, but, you know, overwhelming feeling for us was it was a good signing in terms of where we're at with our defence and the fact that we needed some good championship experience ticked all of those boxes. So um, he they made the point similar to what you were saying there, Jonathan, about um, Sean Morrison putting his body on the line. Daniel Ayala is exactly that type of defender. So they said he'll turn up in the opposition box or in our box, putting his head in the areas where it's going to hurt. So, you know, I really like that. So, yeah, nothing but good things that they said there, Tom. Do you have concerns, Ryan, over his injury record? Obviously, was as Luke said, he was out from Christmas, I think it was. Um, so he's not he's <clears> played a hell of a lot of football. Yeah, they made a bit of um, a tongue-in-cheek comment, actually, about Ayala, that it, it'll get to about February time and he might have his annual injury. So we'll have to see if that one comes to pass. And actually, when I was looking at the stats about Ayala before, you know, that transfer video we did for that, um, I think it's something like 31 games is the maximum he's played in a season, I think it is. So maybe some injury niggles might happen along the way. So Derek Williams and or Scott Wharton are probably going to be called upon. 
I think that's when you come back to squad depth, though, isn't it? Obviously, when you've yeah. got that squad depth, and, and Derek Williams is a perfectly reasonable person to come in, as he's shown in the past the past couple of weeks. Um, another defender we signed, uh, Jonathan, was obviously Douglas. He was one that was sort of there or thereabouts the entire time. Um, how pleased are you with that signing? Because, again, he's got experience of being promoted. Yeah, very pleased, actually. And I think for me, that's possibly, uh, I'd nearly go as far as saying he's potentially our best signing of the summer. Um, I have to admit, you know, he only really come to my sort of eye a couple of years ago, the year we was in League One, and he was he was with, with Wolves and sort of like really tearing it up in terms of uh, uh, goals, set pieces, assists, etc. And I, I thought it was quite harsh that when Wolves did get promoted, one of the first things they did was, was sell, him, sell him to Leeds. And... I think he can only, he obviously was a bit injured at Leeds, but again, his record was good. I don't, I think there was, I'm not sure if they lost a game when he played, I think I read. Um, but then the the send off from the, the Leeds fans was um, was amazing. And the chief exec, the words he said about him. Um, actually, on the flip side to it, I think Amari Bell has been actually quite good this season. And um, I think hopefully the signing of Douglas will, <clears throat> will improve him as well. I don't think ultimately, um, Douglas is going to, uh, Bell's going to keep Douglas out of the team. But I think he can add so much more for us in terms of, I'm quite excited about like the set piece delivery. I think that's actually one thing that we've really struggled with this season since losing losing Downing. Um, especially now that we've got Lenahan, Ayala in the box for the set pieces, Gallagher at times. If, um, if we can get that right, that could be really key to us because if you look at the last two games, we've actually really struggled to create something and there are going to be games where our creative players can't break down banks of fours and fives. So it might be a set piece that wins us the game. Yeah. So having that sort of delivery to stand out can, can only stand us in good stead, in my opinion. Luke, do you think that one of the big things, like Jonathan says, with the Douglas signing, is that set piece delivery? Um, like Jonathan says, it, sometimes it's a moment of magic from a set piece where it's, it's a goal or it's a delivery. Um, and probably since more grew, we've lost that. We don't, we don't look as threatening. Um, is Douglas bringing that, and is that? Do you think that's one of the reasons that Mowbray signed him as well because he can do a bit of both? Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, um, like you said, we've we've lost that since Mowbray, and I think um, it's a great shame that you know. I say a great shame, but we, you know we've moved on, and uh, as a club, we're going in in a direction that obviously didn't take more grew with it and it's you know it's sad because he was a big part of that League One campaign and a big part of that League One campaign was set pieces. Um you know you need to go back to the you know the game that won us promotion really there was a set piece and we we've we've no doubt been dangerous from that in the past and Downing did offer us that like Jonathan said last season but um it's 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 not been quite at that level. Um Barry Douglas brings that, um, like you said, Jonathan, he 14 assists, I think, in that Wolves campaign. It's it's unbelievable start from the left back. Um, Mami Mulgrew got a lot of his assists from further up the field as well, so as well as set pieces. But, I mean, at left back, if we can utilise that as well and getting forward, then, you know, I'm optimistic he, he should bring in goals. So let's, let's hope that that's the case and let's hope that Two promotions um, under his belt. Let's, you know, let's be optimistic. Could it be three? Who knows? <laughs> Certainly hope it is a third. Um, Ryan Douglas is well travelled, isn't he? Obviously, was it Lech Poznan? I think in I'm mm. butcher the um, pronunciation. Is it Konya Spore? Um, yeah. Do you think that is something that benefits us again? Because obviously, whilst this isn't using that scouting network. It's experience in different leagues and experience at Lake Poznan are a big club. Yeah, definitely. I think it just it makes him a more rounded player, doesn't it? And it's quite some I actually didn't realise his his career path into English football. He was like 27, 28 before he made it into uh, into the football league, which was quite surprising. I think the thing Barry Douglas is going to bring us is all the off-field stuff. You know, chatting to the Leeds fan the other day, and then I've had a couple of Wolves fans that have messaged me off the pitch and in the dressing room. He's amazing. So um, when Stuart Dallas made the breakthrough into the Leeds squad last season, apparently Barry Douglas did not mope around one bit. He was in and around all the younger players, coaching them, helping them, probably similar to what we've seen with Elliot Bennett. 
And if we, you know, if you consider the average age of our squad, it's actually quite young. So having players like Barry Douglas alongside Elliot Bennett doing all of that stuff in the dressing room and off the pitch, I think it's a really smart signing from Mowbray and absolutely all of that experience in the European leagues and in those different countries is just going to add what he can bring to that. Certainly. And do you think, Jonathan, obviously, I think Ryan touched on it there, similar to Elliot Bennett and the way that he helps people out. Do you think that's important for Mowbray? Probably a silly question because we know that it is. But do you think that having that uh, personal aspect where Morbid feels you can come in and you can contribute not just as a player, but as someone behind the scenes, similar to how Bennett is doing there, like Ryan mentioned, or don't you saw the interview that Bennett did on the club's Twitter? Yeah. That yeah. sort of thing. Is that incredibly important? Is that almost just as important as bringing in a player like, say, Harvey Elliott, who might bring that wow factor? Yeah, I think so. I think um, we've seen with with Mowbray that he certainly does value those, uh, how people are off the pitch, how their personality is, how their char- characteristics are, how their life outlook is as much as their, their ability on the pitch. And we've seen in the past names mentioned that maybe on paper look good signings, but we just never have touched them because we know they're not the quite the right fit for the, for the club. I think with the championship, it's such a tough, long season that you, you need those sort of, senior know-how, senior people to help support. Taking Dolan as an example, he's come flying into the team. We know that's not going to last, but having those sort of people around that have been there and done that, that sort of can give him advice, give him help. Well, like, well only help is, as, as we've touched on, our squad average age is so young and um, just having those um, senior heads can, can only help. So it does, and the experience that he brings is massive. Um, I think all of you put it perfectly, just with regards to the, the assists that he can bring, the goals he can bring, but also that behind the scenes noose that he has. And it's a, it's a case of he's more than just a signing for the player. He's a signing that can bring a hell of a lot more. Um, moving on to the midfielder that we signed. I'm going to say midfielder because I'm the class, obviously, Dawn and Elliot as attackers because they obviously play third up the pitch. Um, tribal. Now, Luke, I'm going to come to you with this one. Um, Travis got injured, and I think we've lost maybe a bit of that bite in midfield since mm. that injury. Do you think Tribal brings that? Obviously, Norwich, thank, Norwich fans think of him quite highly, um, and I'll speak to you a bit about that, uh, Ryan. But, Luke, is, he, is Tom Tribal going to bring that, that sense of bite, that thing that maybe we've lost since Travis um, has been injured? I mean, it's, it certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Some of the um, the footage that we've seen coming out, um, particularly from Norwich fans, um, I know that it's been circulating uh, around us Rovers fans more recently. Um, it, it, it seems that um, that sort of midfield that will just break up play, um, win the ball, that bit of tenacity, he um, it, it seems to, to, to want, he seems to have that desire um, we need that when you know you, you think of players like you know Robbie Savage, um, you, you think of um, you know Keith Andrews, not the most technically gifted player, but a player that you absolutely wanted in your midfield because he'd go and he needed to win the ball, he'd absolutely 110 percent, he'd, he'd, he'd stick whatever he needed to in there to, to win the ball. And it looks like Tribal's going to be going to be that player for us. I mean, um, he played about 50, 50 appearances, 51 appearances across two seasons. For, for Norwich in the Championship, one promotion with Norwich. Um, again, it's this, it seems to be um, that Morby's looking at these type of players that, that that have that experience in winning promotion and have that experience of going the full season and uh, and succeeding. Um, so he, he certainly fits the bill. So let's hope that he, um, he you know pushes Travis or or at least can sit alongside Travis in, in some of them games when we're playing. You know, the likes of Bournemouth when they're coming to a scoring three goals. So uh, it might be that we, we we need that extra body in there as well. So absolutely, let's, let's hope he's that player. Ryan, do you echo what Luke said just then after speaking to the Norwich fan? Obviously, he brings that bite and that, that experience. Similar to Ayala, almost like throwing his body on the line. Yeah, and I think Robbie Savage was a great comparison, actually, with them, um, you know, after speaking to that Norwich fan. They described him as doing a bit of everything really well, you know, not heavy on goals and assists, but the guy who will 
win the ball back and maybe pass it on to someone who's then going to play the assist. You know, he's that type of central midfield player. And, you know, he's not going to be as dynamic as Travis and he's not going to be the heartbeat of that centre midfield like Travis. But I think, you know, when the chips are down and we need to be a bit solid or we need to get stuck in a little bit, he'll more than, you know, put his shift in. And when I spoke to them, there's a game last season that Norwich won away at Leeds. Um, I think it was three or four one. I think they won. And apparently Tribal had the game of his life in that game, you know, bossed Calvin Phillips in that centre midfield, I think, and, and really got stuck in. So, yeah, I think Savage was, if I think back to what Savage was like for us, that is a really good comparison. Ryan, do you all worry, and obviously the Norwich from love more information on this, I think there was a bit of bit, some issues, hasn't there? I think his wife has been very vocal on Instagram, I, I believe, and obviously he was frozen out a little bit, been training with the under 23s. Is that a concern or do you think that's just a case of his time was up at Norwich? Um, I think it was, uh, when I spoke to the Norwich fan, I think it was more the fact that Alex Tetty and Kenny McLean just outcompeted him in that central midfield area and whether his wife did or didn't understand the footballing reasons for that, I don't know. Um, again, I think it, I personally think it's a really strange decision from Norwich to let him go. I think when you've just been relegated from the Premier League and obviously we're looking at someone like Tribal that's got the experience of getting promoted... You know, why would you get rid of someone like that who you know you can rely on to just come in and do a job? So, you know, Norwich's loss is our gain and he's going to add into our midfield and, you know, really solidify us. So, um, yeah, I think it's more through the ability of others rather than the deficiencies of tribal, if that makes sense, that he was not in their team. No, it certainly doesn't. And Jonathan Ryan spoke about that just then, that he's got promotion experience. That's obviously the last three we've spoke about have all got promotion experience. Um do you think that breeds a mentality of winning, of, of competing? Because these aren't players that are coming to fight relegation, for example. These are players that have hit those dizzy heights and will undoubtedly want to hit them again and have a second a second go, or in Douglas's case, a third. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, just going back to tribal as a whole, I've got quite a few friends who are Norwich fans and literally within 10 minutes of the rumours circulating, I had a message on Twitter saying, you've got a good one here. Simple as that, and echoed all of the, the thoughts that sort of Ryan and um, Luke have touched on. I think actually from, from the characteristics that we described, he would have been perfect for a Saturday just gone against Forest. We lacked that bit of bite in there, that bit of intensity, that, that bit of mobility, really. And I think as, as Ryan alluded to at the start, where we've got a, a, a bigger in-depth squad, I think the, the knock-on effect of actually the new players or making the current players better as well can't be can't be underestimated as well it can really sort of thrive on you can see actually um the the five or five games in training being quite quite tasty and quite 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 competitive really so i don't think you can ever have enough enough winners or enough people that have been there and done that especially to help the the, the people of like armstrong what well, he's only 22 23 Bereton 2021, 20, Dolan 18, Elliot 17, Dak and Rothwell 24, 25. Still very young for a for an average age of a squad. Certainly is, and I think that, like you say, it can bring the experience. They obviously got a little bit of that promotion experience from League One to the Championship, but obviously from the Championship to Premier League, it's a it's a whole new ball game, isn't it? Um, it's it's completely different, and um, you can't rely on the experience when we were by far and away one of the best teams in the league compared to an occasion where we are going to be battling out with about 12, 12, probably 14 other teams that would say, yeah, we'll be in the playoffs or we should be in the playoffs. Um, moving on from Tribal, um, Luke, Tyrese Dolan has been a bit of a revelation, hasn't he, as one of the attackers that we've signed. Now, it's funny we're even talking about him because, and obviously the big thing has been there's been eight signings, but he was never meant to be a signing for the first team, was it? How refreshing has it been to see Tyrese Dolan come in, Luke, and just basically the last game aside, take the take the squad by storm. Wow, is just a word, isn't it? Really, um, completely like you say, re revelation, absolute revelation. Um, Exciting, um, dynamic, quick, great feet, direct, wants to run up players. Um, 
ev everything everything that you want in a winger um, is is fearless, isn't it? His, his, his age is 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 quite beneficial for him, I think, in, in that respect. Um, with no real experience, he just wants to go and show you absolutely what he can do. He's a talented boy, and he wants the championship to know that. He wants Blackburn Rovers fans to know that. I think I liken him a bit to, to a young Damien Duck, really. Um, I don't think um, I was having a, I was having a good think about this earlier. Actually, I don't feel like we've had a player like Tyrese Dolan um, since Damien Duff. I, I can't for the life in me think of someone that exciting that's that actually gets gets you off your feet in terms of a winger so for me I'm excited um, don't want to build the boy up too high I know Rovers fans have had you know past experience of that most football fans most English fans have haven't they um, you see someone talented and we um, you know we instantly think they're, they're the next Lionel Messi and he's certainly not that but he's a he's an exciting young talent um, and he's going to get us goals he's going to get into them areas he's already seen him you know assisting goals scoring goals and, and winning penalties so let's see what this season holds for him let's see what the future holds for him it's only a two year contract so I'm I'm, I'm worried that uh, people will start sniffing around so let's get this boy tied down for a few more years and uh, see what we can do certainly isn't it it's ridiculously high praised from Luke Dare Ryan with Comparisons to Duff, who obviously went to the very top. Um, do you worry about his naivety? Obviously, with experience, that will leave. But there's been a couple of occasions, I think back to the Bournemouth third, where he tried a fancy flick, um, when really he probably should have just held the ball. Um, do you think you've got to take that rough with the smooth and think, well, yeah, he might cost us there, but what he brings elsewhere trumps that yeah absolutely and it goes with the territory doesn't it you know if you're a player like Dolan and we see it at all levels of football that yeah that is the trade-off that they might not be tracking back or whatever um I think Mowbray will coach that out of him I think the thing for Dolan uh that I'm seeing is the biggest fear though for him is when Bradley Dax back when Dax back and we might change formation I don't see where Dolan is in this side because of what we might need to be doing in those wide areas and exactly what you've described there Tom so hopefully he can pin a place down until Dax back and, and keep working hard. And if he's coming off the bench or pushing for a start in place or still starting, still doing all those things. But yeah, um, I, I, just to answer your question, I think it just goes with the territory. You, you have to just accept that that's going to happen. And, you know, that's why the midfield three is, is doing that job, isn't it? That you've got someone who's just going to tuck across onto that side and, and cover in that area. I think you're right. There's, there's, there's more phases of play than just Dolan, perhaps. Yeah. Giving away the ball on one occasion. If he does that, that's fine. It's up to the players like your, your Tribals and your Travises, who are the engine midfield, to to basically put a stop to that, would you say? That's it, yeah. Definitely. That That's what I see. And that's why the 4-3-3 the three, three works for Dolan at the moment, because he's got those three behind that, that are going to do those bits. But as I say, when Dax back might just look a little bit different and it might just lead Mowbray just to think differently about how he's going to use Dolan. I think you'd probably have a, a full podcast on Bradley Dak coming back and where he fits in who you take <laughs> out. So maybe that's one for the future. I know everyone seems to have a different opinion um, mm. on where Bradley Dak goes. Um, Jonathan, Dolan struggled against um, Forrest, didn't he? And a little bit against Cardiff. Didn't quite have the same impact. Do you think it's important not to expect too much too soon from him? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I echo what, what both the, the positive and the, the realistic points that both Ryan and Luke have said. I think we have to bear in mind he's only 18. I think it's also not helped the last couple of games that he's sort of actually just been a, a, a victim of his own success, but equally a victim of our own downfall as a team's inability to break down two banks of four, which is not new for this season. Um, it, we had the same problem last season. It's something that we've got to get over because teams are going to come to Ewood and do that all, all, all season. That's that's clear. Um, I think the good side of him is that actually we had so much issues last year. We were playing strikers out wide to have an out-and-out -out winger that can go and beat yeah. someone. It's great. I think Mowbray's also savvy enough to know when to pull him out of the, um, out the starting eleven. And actually, in hindsight, if everyone would have been fit, 
Dolan actually coming off the bench for the last 20 minutes against Cardiff and Forest could have been a completely different performance. He could have actually had that spark. It was slightly disappointing at Cardiff that he didn't have more chance to run at Cunningham after Cunningham got booked quite quite early on. But he, he is young and um, he's going to play a, play a big part. I feel like every youngster, his form will be up and up and down this season, but we can certainly get, get, get the use out of him. And he's actually a player, I think, that would even be better if crowds are there. If you can imagine him running down the right wing, the Riverside stand all cheering his name behind him. Behind him, I think he'd, he'd be even better. He'd really sort of work harder, have an end product. And yeah, he's got a real real big future, I think, without trying to over big him up too much. I've gone from one extreme to the other there, haven't I? No, I think, I think, I think <laughs> it's fair, though. Um, he has, what he's shown has been, it's all been quality, hasn't it? Um, I'm just going to make a comparison here and I want to get all three of your opinions. Harry Chapman came in, albeit in a league below, and was very similar. Um, got the crowd on the feet. There was everyone were clamouring for him to start. Um, John, I'm going to start with you with this, this question. In a, in a few words, do you have those concerns that Tari Stolen could be a Harry Chapman that gets the crowd off the feet at the start and then slowly begins to look out his depth because whilst we are a league above now than we were in league one Harry Chapman looked out of his depth against Cardiff and not against Cardiff sorry against Nottingham Forest do you have concerns about that at all? Um, yes and no I'd, I'd say no in the fact that I, from what I've seen of Dolan so far and how he's come across both on the pitch off the pitch and on social media he seems a bit more sort of I don't know if, don't know if level headed is the right word, but sort of grateful of the opportunity that's come around. Feet on the he, ground. Yeah, yeah. I think he realised that there's been a, an element of luck in that how the, the start of the season we were down on bodies and he got a chance which normally he would have he would have never had. I think that's just to reiterate what I said in the previous point. It's just more of how he copes with those ups and downs. If he's out of form. And we're playing away and I'll pick the, the typical example at Stoke on a Tuesday night and he's getting kicked up in the air, how he reacts to that. But as much as it's about him, I think it goes back to what you said about those, those others around him, the Ben O's, the Douglases, the um, Bradley Johnsons that can help him put an arm around him, help him um, just show him what's on. But again, it's so hard to predict, isn't it? There's been so many players that have come on the scene and been that good and like two, three years later, they've, they've not been there. Luke, do you have course concerns? Do you, or do you echo what Jonathan said that it's yeah, it's a concern, but let's think positive here. Uh, yeah, you've got. I mean, you've got to think positive with it. Um, he is a young boy, and he has got a great attitude, like Jonathan said. You, you can see that. Um, you can see all over Twitter, all over his sort of Instagram feeds, things like that. Um, he's very proud. He's a he's a family man. Um, he's he's you know, making himself proud and making his family proud, and he he, he seems. Like you said, got his feet on the ground, so so that's one massive, massive positive going forward. Um, I mean, Harry Chapman's still a talented boy as well. He, where it's gone wrong, who knows? Uh, we we don't see behind the scenes and and things. I know that Morbury's obviously still got a lot of hope moving forward for for Chapman as well. Um, so if we can get the best out of Chapman, um, and we've got the the likes of Dolan in in the ranks, then. In terms of wingers, then we are, you know, we are quite gifted in, in them positions. Then we haven't had, you know, the potential to play the the four three 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 effectively um, in the past. Having them sort of players gives us that opportunity to just move it on a level if we need to change it up in games. Um, quick, say exciting, you know, tenacious players, dynamic players that when. You know, teams are tired. Teams look like they're open to be broke down. Then we can bring these players off the bench as well, um, fresh legs, and let's let's see what they can do. But yeah, in terms of uh, the comparisons to Harry Chapman, let's just um, you know take it game by game and, and see. Um, who knows? Would you agree with that, Ryan? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, what I'll say about Dolan, I think raw ability wise, this seems to have more of it. Just some of those little step overs and, and raw pace that he's got seems to be a bit different to Chapman. But in Chapman's defence, I'll just offer two things. Um, 
he got injured in the October of that League One season, didn't he? And we didn't really hit form until November. So he was never in a side that was up there in League One. So who knows what would have happened had he been in that side. And I think the second thing, that injury that he had was a bad injury. I think, you know, I think it was similar to the Michael Owen injury, wasn't it? Where he tore the hamstring muscle off the bone or whatever. So whether he's just lost that half yard of pace that he used to have or his confidence has been shot with that. I remember Michael Owen talking about coming back from that injury and he said it never felt the same. He never felt that 100% on that leg. And if Chapman's got a bit of that and he's just self-doubting himself now, maybe that's coming through on the training pitch and stuff. So just a couple of things in Chapman's defence there, I think, just in the interest of fairness. No, I think I think it's, it's, it's entirely fair to comment on it. I think that it's easy to forget that it was a, a terrible injury. He did it twice, didn't he? Because obviously he did mm. it against the Wigan, then didn't he do it against Aston Villa in, in an under-23s game, in like That's his right. first game back? So it was, I suppose, one enough, and like I say, in the interest of fairness, whilst he did look out of his debt, there's got to be reasons for that, and perhaps it's important to give him that chance and say, well, you can still show us what you can do because we seen it once and hopefully you can get back there. Yeah. Um, we're going to go from one young boy to an even younger boy. Now, this, I don't know about you boys, I'm I'm 22 and this lad's <laughs> 17. Right. I don't know the ages of you, but uh, it, it makes you just feel a bit inadequate, doesn't it, really? Harvey Elliott. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to throw this to you. Um I guess he was the marquee signing, um, despite only being 17 years old. There's been suggestions in the past, especially when he was at Fulham, that he has an attitude problem. But he's the youngest ever Premier League player, the youngest ever Fulham player, the youngest ever Liverpool player. Does Harvey Elliott bring something to this team that other players can't? I think so. I think so. I have to admit that I've not seen him play too much. I think one, one thing I was quite impressed with him, and actually I watched the, the interview that he did with uh, BBC Radio Lancashire earlier with Andy Bays, and he came across really well for a 17-year-old to actually think that, if I remember back when I was 17 many moons ago, to be stuck in front of a camera and doing press conferences like that would have been absolutely, absolutely daunting. Um, Liverpool fans speak of him really highly. There was a lot made about how actually um, Klopp didn't want to get him to, to let him go. There's been a lot made about how, if you compare him to Harry Wilson, Ben Woodburn, other players that have gone on loan, he's completely different because a lot of Liverpool fans say that he was ready for the first team and could have made an impact. A lot of them seem to think that he fits the 4 3, 3 system quite well. So, yeah, I think there's... there's there's a lot of excitement around it as well. How well he'll do, time will tell. But I am excited to see him put on put on the blue and whites and see whether, well, how he's going to be able to cope in a more physical championship league or whether he's going to make more impact off the bench. Could he be someone actually that is a bit more of a flair player and can unlock defences? So a lot of unknown really with that with that one, Tom. But hopefully, hopefully we'll see a lot of positives come from it. I think there is a lot of unknown, despite him probably being the most well-known, well known. most yeah. high-profile um, <laughs> sign that we made. I think I think you are spot on that no one really knows. I think there was an interesting thread, don't know if you saw, I think Andy Watson shared it on Twitter, um, that was just speaking about players that go out and mourn, and that with Elliot, it's, it, like you say, it is the unknown, because he's so young. Um, Ryan... Jonathan mentioned about having a camera shoved in your face at the age of 17. Um, he's obviously not someone that's deciding to do it because he wants to be a big YouTuber or a fantastic set of podcasters. Um, he's doing it because he's got to. Is it to be expected that there have been occasions where there has been so much fame at such a young age that perhaps he has made mistakes? I think so. But one thing I'll say, I think to succeed at the highest level in football, you have to have a touch of arrogance. You have to have a touch of self-confidence. And one of my favourite players of all time is Sergio Ramos, because I love the fact that he's an absolute animal who will just do whatever it takes to win. And he's confident in his own ability. So 
Harvey Elliott, Harvey Elliott will probably, you know, succeed with Liverpool because he's got that self-confidence. So, yeah, if at 15 years old you're being paid, you know, however many hundreds or thousands of pounds by Fulham, you, you're you going to flash the cash a little bit. I've been 15 once, but I didn't have that amount of money, but I probably wouldn't have done something as stupid as, as that. So, in a way, I'm trying to applaud it and, in a way, trying to see how Mowbray might just turn that into a positive. Because in those games like Cardiff at home or Forest at home on Saturday, we need someone like Harvey Elliott to come on and say, I don't give a damn who any of you are on this pitch. I'm going to come on and stick that ball in the top corner. So maybe that could be something that is a bit of a game changer for us. And for the record, I think um, Elliot Bennett and Bradley Johnson are the only two older than me, Tom, in the squad. So 17 (laughs) is nothing. (laughs) <laughs> well you see I didn't want to say anything I don't want to be careful when I said it um, I'm one of the younger ones you see I, f- I hope I think I don't know maybe I'm not um, but yeah it, well, if I can say 17 hours refereeing on a Sunday for um, people and I'd get like make 25 quid I'd go out buy a new pair of shoes after a few weeks and I'd be like showing them to girls and you can't blame the lad can you because he's no um, you can't thousands and and it's to be expected isn't it it's it's not easy um luke do you think that elliot's going to be a bit of a target i know a lot of people on twitter of opposition fans have been obviously showing horrible tackles basically and and that's what center halves and fullbacks in the the championship are going to do to elliot when he first touches the ball is he going to have a target on his back is it going to be a case of this is harvey elliot this young lad, bit cocky, come from Liverpool, well known. Let's let's bring him back down to earth and show him show him what adult football is all about. I think um, at any level, I think Sunday League, even if a young, exciting, you know, quick, good feet footballers like that take to the park, they get kicked up in the air straight away, don't they? Anyone with experience will will try and wind a player like that up, try and. You know, these are talented players and um, in football, people do, you know, whatever they can. You're talking about Sergio Ramos, just to get, you know, one over, it's it. It's competitive, isn't it? That's what it's all about. Um, whether he'll have a target on his back specifically, I, I don't know. But um, people, you know, you know, defenders will try and uh, try and get one over on him, over on him I'm sure. Um, we've got... We've spoken now about three wingers. Um, if we if you throw Chapman into the mix as well, um, young exciting players really. I mean, Ch- we're talking about ages. Chapman's not not old. Uh, certainly not old. Um, these types of players will will get a few kicks over the season, I'm sure. But um, hopefully that'll um, that'll round him. That'll that'll be the sort of thing that a player like Harvey Elliott needs. Uh, you're talking about maturity, and you're talking about. Um, Aging, experience, things like that. Um, maybe Harvey Elliott will benefit from, you know, in inverted commas, in, in having a target on his head. Let's say so. Um, definitely, definitely going to get a few kicks. Jonathan, do you think Luke glossed over that just then about how it's probably going to maybe enhance him? Do you think it's a case of finding your kick, and bought I'm going to nutmeg you and score an absolute worldie, almost giving that? fire and that passion to, to really prove them wrong. Yeah, definitely. I think um, he's probably, we probably don't appreciate how well he's been schooled at Liverpool when you look at their front three of Salah, Mane, Firmino, how much Salah gets kicked, how much Mane gets kicked. And um, going back to Ryan's analogy, Mane, he's quite a, quite a nasty, aggressive player just because he wants to win. And he's got that bite. And if that's something that Elliot's picked up, then, then great. I think that, as Ryan said, that you do need a touch of arrogance, actually. And, um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me to, to see him and Bradley Dack competing for the amount, amount, most amount of nutmegs in the game or something like that. <laughs> be good fun to watch. <laughs> I certainly would, and I think, I think, I know you speak about Bradley Dack again, but how exciting is it that you've got Harvey Elliott, Tyree Stone, Bradley Dack, these are players that can change games. Um, Ryan, would you go along with that in the you know, this is an exciting time. Bradley Dack is almost, we've not spoke about him really, but he's almost like a new signing. 
Yeah, definitely. And I, I just think, you know, in terms of Elliot and Dolan in particular, I think that Mowbray's got the people who we trust. We've got players like Elliot Bennett, Bradley Johnson, who are experienced. We've got more raw talents like Joe Rothwell, Joe Rankin Costello, who, you know, may or may not have contributed so far. Elliot and Dolan are just completely at that other end of the spectrum, which is just throw them on, see what they can do. And I think that's probably what we have lacked in, in some of the games. And you know, Elliot might have come on and, and scored against Cardiff, for example. He might have come on and scored against Nottingham Forest. So I think he's actively targeted that a little bit, hasn't he, Mowbray? Just a real kind of, well, I'm just going to throw you on and see what you can do. So, I yeah, it, totally it, it Brennan, is exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah was given that. Yeah, it was almost that uh, case of, yeah, like you say, just go on and if you score, then you're a hero. And you need that as a manager sometimes, you know. Um Klopp's even done it himself that Merseyside derby when Pickford palmed that ball down onto Origi it's telling me he threw Origi on just to go and win that game no he threw him up just go go and do something you know that you just need that sometimes you can be the, be the best manager in the world you just need something to go your way and these young lads can can maybe be the ones to do that we certainly hope they will and, and I think that basically rounds off the players we've brought in um I think, I hope, I hope I've not missed anyone. Um, so we are going to move on to the retained players now. Um, and by retain, I mean those obviously that we've not sold. Um, I think Derek Williams is one that we spoke about before. Um, and I pulled my hands up and said they both, well, all three of them, reminded me that I need to talk about him because obviously there was rumours that he would be going. Um, Luke, um, Derek Williams is one that, there's been a couple of occasions now where he's, he's said he's going to be sold or he's almost being sold. What was your opinion before the season started? How did you feel about, about those rumours? Was it something that you were happy with or were you of the opinion that we need to keep him for squad depth? Um, I wouldn't say I was happy that he was going. Um, uh, for me, Williams... <laughs> He's, he's sort of what Groves are about at the moment. He's, he's like that Elliot Bennett character. He, he, he's like, you know, one of the boys behind the scenes, uh, that sort of Morbury effect. Um, so he's a good person, absolutely, to have, a, have around the place um, from from what you see, for, from what you read. Um, in terms of him going, I, I was almost thinking that, yeah, if he goes, we'll bring someone else in, whether it be a loan, to bring that depth. So I wasn't worried about him going in that respect. Um, I didn't really have a, a great opinion on it. If he went, he went. If he, you know, he didn't, he didn't. When the season started, though, um, my opinion fast changed because I realised what a, a decent squad player we had there, and I thought I feel like I could take, I've sort of taken it for granted in the past past season, particularly. Um, he came in, did a great job, formed a good partnership with with Lenny, and, and you're almost thinking then I always going to have to do something to get into this, you know, in, into this team. Which is good. Uh, that's the sort of squad player I want. Someone who is pushing on. Someone who's um, not not particularly content to be on the bench, but um, sort of knows his place. But wants to wants to push those boys for us for a starting place. So in the end, really glad that he has stayed and uh, you know hope, hope he does push the boys for a for a starting place. Definitely. And Ryan Luke basically hit an nail on the head there, didn't he? And that he's a good squad player. And you spoke a lot about squad depth at the start of the podcast. Is that something that you see as well with Williams, that he's that perfect player that if Ayala goes out of form or gets injured or Lennon is out of form or gets injured, you've got a ready-made replacement coming straight in? Yeah, absolutely. And and Williams is is the type of player that will happily be that, you know, first choice backup defender, won't he? He's not going to upset the apple cart. He's not going to disturb Mowbray's, you know, dressing room that he's done so much to build uh, all that stuff off the pitch. So, yeah, I think it fits really perfectly. And he's obviously, he's had player of the season at championship level. He's been down into League One with us. He is a guy who we can trust. And Yes, he might have divided opinion in pre-season when it looked like he was going out. But yeah, I think ultimately we've got to be happy that he stayed. You know, just a good person we can rely on just to, as you say, fill those gaps. Jonathan, has Williams having to isolate come at the worst possible time for the player himself? Because obviously you couldn't have took him out of that side on form alone. Whereas now obviously it's given Ayala and uh, Lenihan the opportunity to play together. Williams probably won't be back for, I guess, another week yet. 
Um, is it come at the worst possible time for him? Yeah, yeah. In reality, he's been a victim of his own success, hasn't he? Because his pre-season form has actually got him back into the Ireland squad. I have to admit, I was one that, what, two months ago, knowing that he was going into his last year of his contract, knowing that he'd hardly played towards the end of last season, seemed very injury prone, was like, well, actually, now might be the time to cash in. If we can get a bit of cash for him in his last year of contract and reinvest it, that'd be a good idea. I think actually what remembering the first game of pre-season away at Fleetwood, second half, I think he was quite poor in that as well. And I was like, no, now the time is right. But how he's turned around it is around has been great. I think back to the Leicester, the last pre-season game when we had a very young side out, second half he commanded. He him and McGlaw kept Vardy out of the game. I know it's only a pre-season friendly, he got the equaliser. And he's just gone from strength to strength. We we can't lose sight of what. Ryan said from talking to the Middlesbrough fans that Ayala will have an injury. There's no way Lennon is getting through the whole season without getting an injury. He always does. I think that as well, that it won't, wouldn't surprise me at some point if we do see actually Williams and Wharton as a centre-half partnership if the other two are, mm. two are getting injured. So, no, I think we've got to be, we've got to be really happy that he's, that he's stayed and definitely he's got a big part to, to play this year. I think I was probably with you, Jonathan, thinking that it probably would be a good time to, to cash in. But like Luke said, I was of that thinking as long as we brought someone else in. And that would have needed to be more than just Ayala. It would have had to have been another centre-half. And because obviously we didn't sell him, probably Morbury didn't see it as something that was really pressing and bringing in the likes of Douglas um, and Pears was, was more important. Um, another player, Ryan, that I'm going to talk about with those that have been retained is, is Adam Armstrong. There's a, a few um, rumours on Twitter. Don't know if any of them were, were realistic, though, um, that obviously there was some premiership interest in Armstrong. Obviously had a very good start to the season. Um, not done much against Cardiff and Nottingham Forest, but neither did, it, did anyone else. Um, how important was it that we re- retained his services similar to the way we did Dak the previous season? Uh, absolutely vital, um, especially with Bradley Dak out. You know, Armstrong has just stepped up into that talisman mould, hasn't he? So, you know, he's been the one getting the goals and he's been the one leading the line. And I've got absolutely no doubt that Premier League clubs are looking at him now, um, particularly if you look at the the rate of clean sheets in the Premier League. Premier League teams aren't going to go and panic by a defender. They're going to go and panic by a striker. So I've got no doubt Premier League clubs are now looking at him. Um, I think if he carries on this form, there's going to be teams in January probably putting a bid in. We've seen it with players like Ollie Watkins before, Neil Morpé. You know, if you get goals at this division, ultimately you're going to get some interest. So for us to see us through to January with Dak injured, as I say, and, you know, with some of the other players who have been missing, it was absolutely critical that we kept him and, and obviously delighted that we have. 100%. I think you are, again, I said it the 100 times this podcast, but you are spot on just with that sense that when you score goals, we've seen it before, Jordan Rhodes, Rudy dead. Um, yeah. When you score goals, you become all of a sudden a, a commodity that people want and want to buy. Um, yeah. And he, he definitely has been doing that. So to keep him and basically fend off any real interest probably has to be seen as one of the results of the window, would you say? Yeah, and I think he um, he doesn't strike me as the character that would try and force a move either. You know, from what I've seen on Instagram and other things, I think he's got a long-term girlfriend that he's been with for a number of years, quite happy with his football at, at Rovers and wouldn't really be anchoring for a move. And it would just be one of those that probably similar to Jordan Rhodes, that when the time is right and the bid comes in, he'll just go with our blessing. You know, it'll be that type of one. So whether we can keep offering Adam Armstrong 40 grand a week every time to stay is obviously another story. So it might be sooner rather than later once that interest materialises. But um, yeah, it was, it was vital we kept him, wasn't it? Definitely. And then Luke, Lewis Travis is another one that we've retained, obviously. I think there was discussions probably around January um, this year of the Newcastle interest. That didn't really go anywhere. Is Travis another one that Really, he's one of the, it's the cliche thing that commentators say on Sky that Lewis Travis's work goes unnoticed, but he's really good. But the fact that you say it's unnoticed shows that you notice it. Is that very much Travis's style and that without him, we'd, we'd really struggle? As um, maybe we are doing, as he's injured. Yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying there. Um, Travis is that kind of player, isn't he? But then 
I almost see Travis as as somebody who who, who could captain Blackburn Rovers one day. Um, he does seem quite vocal. Um, you do say that he, he goes unnoticed, which is which is, you know, in a sense he does in in the in his ability. Um, but with some that's fair because he's very good in the ball as well. He's not just a, a tough tackling midfielder who. Who, like we said about tribal, is mm-hmm. he's just there to break up play. He's also he's got a good shots on him. He scored a couple of goals last season. The Middlesbrough goal was brilliant, wasn't it? The way he yeah. started that, and, and there was the one against Luton as well. So he, he's more than just a, a midfield general. Yeah, he's dangerous outside the box, isn't he? He's not someone that, as a as an opposing side, you, you want to give any space outside the box. You say he's got a shot on him. Um, he can pass the ball. Um, he's he's someone who 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 links up. The, the attack and the defence he, he, he's that sort of in between he's quite happy to be on the ball um, but like you say in terms of his technical ability that almost goes unnoticed because of you know he's hard hitting tackles he's not scared of going in, into a challenge um, you know we've seen him come off worse off in the past and end up injured but uh, he's um, I'm sure when he does come back from from this injury that he unfortunately suffered in a you know in a league cup game which were we really ever going to go anywhere in this league cup this season? It's a, it's a bit of a shame to lose a player in a in a, in a game like that, but um, we did, and we, we, we're missing it now, absolutely. So when he does come back, I don't think he'll be uh, be um, any different from the player that he was. Um, I'm hoping the same for you know for the likes of Dak and some of them long term injuries that we're 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 at the moment. Like you said, miss, missing quite a bit, I think, um, and and we absolutely saw that against Forest. We just didn't have that in the centre of midfield. We didn't have his, his tenacity, did we? So, um, really lucky to keep kept hold of a player like Travis. Um, I'm sure the um, you know the transfer rumours that were flying about um, about Lewis Travis were were, were concrete because um, you know a player like that they're quite rare, aren't they? So you, you want a player like that in your side, and we're lucky to have him. Certainly are. And from players retained, we're going to look at those that have left the club now. Um, Jonathan, there's a, a few loans that we'll discuss briefly, but I think the one that people really care about is, is Charlie Mulgrew. Obviously scored the goal that got us promoted back to the Championship. And I think in his own ways, he's a, he's a club legend. I don't know if they say legends thrown around too loud. You, know, you say it about everyone. But for Mulgrew, the, the impact that he had especially in the, the League One season and the, the first season back in the Championship. Um, how disappointed are you to see the player go, but how much do you acknowledge that you know it, it is the right move? Oh, yeah, it's 100% the right move. It's just, obviously, as football fans, we want everything to be a fairy tale, don't we? We, want him, we would have been nice to him to leave on better terms, have a last game in front of Ewood so we could all all thank him. But the writing's been on the wall for, for that one for, for ages, really. I think I think back to the first game of last season when we played Charlton at home and he was very cumbersome, very slow. You could see that he wasn't sort of probably the, the right sort of personality or the, the playing style that, that Mowbray wanted moving forward. I know he had a little outburst on social media a couple of weeks ago, but for 90%, 95% of the time, he's been absolutely perfect. He's been another one of those people in the dressing room that's, that's, that's pushed us forward, really. But, yeah, he was he was, he was was never going to figure this season. It's obviously a bit frustrating that maybe we couldn't have had a cleaner cut in terms of a transfer fee and sort of the wages off, off the bill. But at the same time, he's um he's been a great servant. I was at Doncaster that night. We'll never forget that. I was at numerous games where he'd scored free kicks, corners, etc. And um, again, going back to Ryan's analogy, of Sergio Ramos was a defender that just scored so many goals, which is amazing. If you was in your fancy football team, you'd have points left, right, and centre for him, wouldn't you? And Ryan, I think Jonathan touched on it there that obviously. It's not been amicable, has it? It's not been the fairy tale ending that we want. Like you say, you'd love for him to have left, you know, the full Ewood, similar to like Danny Graham, left for the full Ewood, his contracts up. Um, is that disappointing? Is it disappointing that he had that little outburst on Twitter and that obviously his last performance was a pretty poor overall one for everyone um, against uh, Barnsley? 
Yeah, I think so. But again, it's probably one that I can understand. You know, we've sat on this um, podcast tonight talking about our centre-back area and how without Ayala, we've not got much cover there. You know, Mulgrew is a player that's probably got confidence in his own ability and is looking at that thinking, why the hell's Mowbray not playing me? You know, you're thinking of getting rid of Derek Williams and you've not signed Daniel Ayala yet. Why aren't you, you know, believing in me? So I can probably get the frustration a little bit. I think... You know, it was a little bit petulant, though, wasn't it? After, you know, what Mowbray did to, to really rescue Rovers and, you know, really build Mulgrew into this cult figure for us in that League One season, you know, Mowbray played a big role in that. So I think Mowbray deserved a little bit better from Mulgrew, actually, as frustrated as he was. So, yeah, it's a shame it wasn't amicable. And, you know, I'll just prefer to remember him for, for all those free kicks and that Doncaster winner, as, as we've said. And Luke and Ryan put it perfectly there. Just you want to remember him for the good, not not the the rocky end. Is as more grew creative memories that you'll tell your kids about. We'll tell our kids about. And he's one of those players that in the future we'll look back on and think, yeah, Charlie Mulgrew was a was a, a vital cog in the machine in that League One season. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that goal alone. Um... You know, writes him into folklore, doesn't it? So, um, you know, we can talk about that little blemish on his CV now. This this little um, tweet that he put out there, and, and and yeah, it didn't read well at all, did it at the time? But um, absolutely, you can understand his frustration. It's like you say, um, he could have quite easily slotted in at, at centre half um, in his own head. Um, but you know, he's, he's well into his thirties now. Um, unfortunately. Football rest for no one and football clubs rest for no one. And um, let's just remember the good times where Charlie Mulgrew is concerned because if we wouldn't have retained, you know, the services of players like Charlie Mulgrew, we wouldn't be in this position now in the Championship. So, um, absolutely um, put on record here on this podcast that uh, we wish Charlie Mulgrew all the best and thank him for his services to this club. So, 100%. I think Jonathan Luke put it spot on there that, you know, he could have left, couldn't he? And I think he said in his um, interview with Andy Bears on Radio Lanks, that after the relegation, there was opportunity for him to go. Um, does he deserve more credit that he did stick around? Or is it something that he should have been doing anyway because he contributed to that relegation? Um, yes and no, really. I think you see it all the time, that clubs get relegated and their, their private assets go, etc., I seem to remember that, that that season he got relegated. That's the first season he got bought in by, by Owen Coyle and the amount of uproar there was on social media. Why have we offered this injury-prone Scottish player a three-year contract? And the irony behind that is actually was the subsequent contract that we offered him that is actually more questionable. Um, but, yeah, no, I think um, he he's done more than enough for the club. He's, he's led from the front. You could see he was a popular figure within within the dressing room and, and as Luke said it's just just a massive thanks from us all really he'll he'll, he'll be remembered and he's he's really helped us out do you echo that Ryan remember the the good of Charlie Mulgrew like we've said rather than that, that yeah 100% yeah definitely well from Charlie Mulgrew to players that perhaps haven't had as much impact on on Blackburn as a squad um so obviously Matty Platt, I think he's left, hasn't he? Um, Andy Fisher, he's gone. Moles has gone alone with Tom White. Um, Andy Fisher will speak about because obviously he's been in and around the first team now for what feels like forever, despite his age. Ryan, we've brought in three goalkeepers. Is it understandable that Fisher's gone? Is it a case of well, what well, you're probably fourth or fifth now in the pecking order? Yeah, we spoke about it earlier, didn't we, with a keeper on loan that's not ours and, and Luke Weiler, who, you know, wasn't good enough to make the grade. There was an opportunity there for Fisher to snatch that opportunity and at least make himself number two, if not pushing Walton for number one when he was wobbling a bit last season. So I think Mowbray's seen him. The coaching staff have obviously had a look at him and the consensus is he's not going to be good enough for championship levels. So, you know, he goes with our kind of blessing and, and goodwill. You know, he's another one through the academy. Um, so hopefully he does well for MK Dons. And yeah, just just an understandable one, really. Is that similar with Matty Platt, do you think, um, 
Jonathan. Obviously, he's gone to Barrow on a permanent deal to be released from his contract. Um, is he the same? Where obviously there was a cent- the spot at centre half, essentially up for grabs, I guess, if if the right player had come in, or that the right youth player had really made an impact. Um, is my plan just one of them where he's just not really up to the standard we need? I think so, and not not wanting to sound <clears throat> negative or derogatory to any of the players. I think the whole list of people that you've mentioned that have have left or gone on loan, etc. You just can't really see them breaking into the team as well. The positive was we're a club on an upward trajectory that even if we don't make the playoffs this year, I'm pretty sure we'll finish higher than we've, we've finished before in the championship. Mowbray's moving us forward. Very similar with the majority of the players that have, that have left. It's just, it's just football. We've, we're on a journey going forward and unfortunately people fall by the wayside. Hope they do well. Hope they make good sort of... Um, careers. Matty Platt's obviously with, with David Dunn, so hopefully he gets a gets a good career out of them. But yeah, like I said, I just can't see any of those. Some of them have been around the club for quite a few years. And if they've not made the grade now and we're on this upward movement, then you just you just can't see it. Players become victims of success, don't they? I think another yeah, yeah. one that we've we've not mentioned because obviously he was released, but Richie Smallwood, yeah. um a great servant in that league one season, similar to Mungrew, but we just moved faster than what Richie Small would keep up with. And, and like like all three of you said, that's football. Um, sometimes you don't keep up and you have to take that step back to get an opportunity. It's similar to how Douglas has done, taking the step back from the Premier League and, and thinking, well, I'm going to go for it with Blackburn. Um, moving on then from the outgoings, there's a player that was here last season that has been touted by many to return. Um, that player, of course, is Stuart Downing. Um, Luke, Downing obviously was offered a contract, didn't take it. The offer was retracted saying, OK, let's let's look at our resources and let's focus them elsewhere. Would you like to see him return? Is he one, Is he a player that, that you'd like to see back in the, the blue and white halves? Um, in a nutshell, absolutely. Yeah, I would. Um, to put it into perspective, we're you know we're all men of a, of a working age. Um, he's coming to the end of his career now. He's got a family to think about. Um, so I absolutely understand why he may, might have looked at a contract and then thought about going elsewhere. Um, that is human nature. Um, so I cannot you know fault him for that. If we have the opportunity to bring him back, like I say, absolutely I would like to. Um, is Got undoubted pedigree. He's been around. Uh, he's you know played for Liverpool, played for Borough, um, England caps. Um, last season, did we think that we were going to be getting a Stuart Downing of old? No, we didn't. Did we get a Stuart, Stuart Downing of old? Probably not. But did we get a quality Stuart Downing? Absolutely, yeah, we did. Um, he still has ability. Um, and my biggest shock actually last season, he, he still has a good yard of pace, doesn't he? He's, he, he certainly not. Not slowing his um in football terms all the age. So um yeah, um Stuart Downing would bring um class, he would bring pedigree and it we've already spoke about having uh, quite a, a young average age in the side. So to, to to bring someone of Stuart's experience and um just hopefully give the boys a bit of a bit of a push to have someone someone like him um with his CV around the place, um, it's only going to be positive, isn't it? So, if the price is right for Rovers, and um, you know, if uh, it's something that Morbury thinks is right, then at the moment, everything Morbury's touching is uh, is looking pretty good. So, uh, let's just trust in what he's doing. Certainly, and of course, for you, Ryan, that's a, another player that will be older than you in the Blackburn squad. So, that's yes. got to be great news for you. <laughs> yeah, fantastic news. And um, the guy's a model pro, isn't he? So, um, you know, think of the discussion we've been having tonight about Tyree Stolen, Harry Chapman, Adam Armstrong, um, Ben Brereton, Rankin Costello, all guys in their early 30s. This is a guy that broke through at Middlesbrough, eventually made it into the England squad and stayed in that England squad for quite a few years. And, you know, even this in the twilight of his career, still looks after himself still conducts himself impeccably and obviously with his performances last season was one of our most important players so 
having someone like Downing in this squad who all those players are just reeled off can aspire to be and just see the example of this is what you can become if you work hard. For me, it's just absolutely a positive and, and hopefully it gets done. And as Luke said, if the price is right, hopefully it doesn't break the bank or or whatever. So hopefully we see him soon. Yeah, I believe he came second as well, didn't he, in the, the player of the year vote. So like you said, he, he had a fantastic season and one that I guess there were concerns about, as Luke mentioned as well, we've been burnt before by the older players looking to get one last paycheck. So for him to come in and, like you say, be a model pro was refreshing from a, an elder statesman. Yeah, and that was my first fear as well. You know, Danny Murphy and, you know, even Peter Whittingham, you know, rest in peace. Um, you know, he... he wasn't the best for us was he Whittingham so there are players that we've had in that ilk before who you just think but no he, he was absolutely a, a really nice surprise last season certainly wasn't and I want to move on now really from our thoughts and our questions I want to move on to some of the the, the listeners questions and when I say listeners it looks like listener to be honest um so I hope more people listen to this than than just the the, the two questions from the same person we've got um but both from jay metcalf um jonathan i'm gonna fire the this this question to you this first one here um jay asks which signing do you think will be the most significant and why um i think that sort of touched on it earlier i think it's, it's barry douglas for me in terms of experience know-how set pieces delivery um what he brings on and off the field Equally, um, I think, as we've mentioned his name numerous times, we, we're not going to appreciate till it happens how good, how big Bradley Dak is for us. Um, he's going to really just, I think, come back and all the thoughts about where does he play, what's his best position, I don't care, just get him in the team. I think at the same time, just to sort of divert a little bit, but add to, to that, um, I know Mowbray's not normally one that has a, a big squad, but I think this season more than ever, you can't have enough good players, a congested fixture list, injuries, COVID. Who, who of us could have predicted at two o'clock when the team news come out on Tuesday, um, Saturday that Joe Rothwell wouldn't be in it? And this is only going to happen more and more, et cetera. We've got to find different ways to play. So there'll be some games where we need Dax quality, Dolan's pace, Downing's ability to, to keep on the ball. So... I don't. I think everyone sitting in that squad, Mowbray, will be telling you have a part to play this year. Definitely, I think again, spot on. Just Joe Rothwell was a banker to be in the squad, and like I say, that's only going to happen more and more. Um, it's got a bit more political as, as rates rise. You don't know who's going to be in and who's not going to be in. Um, Ryan, who for you is the the most significant signing? Um, I agree with Barry Douglas. Um, having chatted to that Leeds fan, as I say, it's all that off the pitch stuff that I really, really like. And, you know, just with the the average age of our squad, as we've spoken about, I just want someone like Barry Douglas just coaching these players and, and making them be better men. And, and Mowbray's spoken about that, hasn't he? You know, he's open about the fact that he's an honest family guy and players like Barry Douglas and Elliot Bennett and others like that, Stuart Downing, will role model Tony Mowbray as a man and imprint that on these younger players. So, yeah, for me, it's Barry Douglas as well. And hopefully we get the rate of assists that he got for Wolves in that season that, that Jonathan referenced earlier. If we can get anything like that, then, you know, we're onto a real winner playing-wise as well. And for you, Luke? Um, echoing um, that with Barry Douglas, but for me... Um... It's it's Kaminsky and not particularly just Kaminsky. Um, I, I think it's, it's it's probably adding the other two goalkeepers as well. Um, so what you hear about Kaminsky is that he he, he was unquestionably the the number one for again um, fourteen appearances in in Europa League as well. Um, up until um, up until COVID, in fact, he was undisputed number one. But he, he has got a couple of mistakes in his locker. Fortunately, we haven't seen that yet. Um, but I think when you've got the likes of, of Persian Sergiakis um, now, it, you know, and the RI players, they, they're not going to be going back um, to the parent clubs anytime soon. Uh, we're lucky to have them. Um, they're they're going to be sort of on. His, he's going to have to be on his toes, as Kaminsky. So we're hopefully going to get the best out of Kaminsky. Um, and then when you've got a, a goalkeeper of, of, of that ilk. 
um, hopefully it's going to bring the best out of the back four. So, I mean, you want to look back at, you know, years of Brad Friedel and when you have a, a keeper of, of that quality uh, that instills such confidence and belief in a, in a back four that you haven't got someone who's going to make a mistake. Um, it's uh, hopefully going to stop us um, leaking goals, which I think has been one of the biggest problems um, with Blackburn Rovers and one of the biggest bugbears of a Blackburn Rovers fan because as many goals as we scored, we let in last season. So uh, the 60 and the 64, like you say, um, if we can can just shore up a bit, um, hopefully that um, lets us win a few games, 1-0 and 2-1, uh, which we haven't been able to do sometimes. You aren't wrong. And, and moving from the goalkeeping uh, department to the opposite end of the pitch, Jay Metcalf also asks, um, do you think we needed to add a striker? Uh, Ryan, I'm going to throw this one to you first. Did we need to add a striker or do you think we can make do with what we've got? Because obviously Adam Armstrong is capable of scoring 15-20. You know when Bradley Dack comes back, he's capable of doing that. Sam Gallagher can hopefully recapture that form in his first law move and obviously the the enigma that is Ben Brereton. Mm. Uh, I think ultimately, yes, we can make do with what we've got because of the formations I'm expecting us to play, particularly when you know Bradley Dack comes back. It wouldn't surprise me if Bradley Dack was a false nine, for example. So I think, yes, we can make do, but my personal preference is, ironically, I always like someone like a Danny Graham in and around the squad, just a big lump who you can bring on just to pump a ball up to. Um, I think you always need that. And I always remember, I think it was Birmingham, maybe a few seasons ago, they had a 38-year-old Kevin Phillips in their squad. And it's just someone like that. Watford have signed Glenn Murray. Someone in that mould who we can just rely on, who's going to be happy to sit on the bench and they'll come on and play their role. If there was anyone like that around, then I would have liked us to maybe bring them in. But Obviously, I totally appreciate that finance-wise, it's probably not possible. So, yeah, we'll make do. Luke, do you think the striker should have been on the agenda? Um, not particularly, no. I mean, I've, I've just something just come to my mind of a of a sort of a front four with um, Dole on one side, Elliot the other, Dak in behind Armstrong. How exciting is that, guys? Feeling no. that. Um, but um, no, in, in reality, um, like you say, you mentioned Brereton. Um, I'd like to see him play down the middle. Um, I know goals aren't, you know, key to his game. He's never been a goal scorer when you look at stats, and stats don't lie, really. Um, but, again, you've got Gallagher, haven't you? And we paid a lot of money for Gallagher. Um, for both of them? Well, absolutely, yeah. Um, and, you, I mean, Gallagher's got to got to expect now that he, he isn't in that starting, starting eleven. Um, so, hopefully, that now brings the best out of him and we've got a, a ready-made goal going on the bench um, uh, he's just got to start showing it hasn't he so I think in reality um, if we'd have brought another striker in where does that leave um, £30 million pounds? so I think Mowbray must be looking at them two players and, and hoping that he's, he's got people that can come in and mm. score goals at some point um, so I think that's probably the thinking behind it um, let's just wait and see and it's probably worth mentioning uh, Conor McBride because he's not a uh, He's obviously not been brought in to play in the first team, but the rate of scoring goals in PL2 at the moment, um, if, if it came to it, um, we've potentially got a, a talent there and we've already gone gone about building some young kids up. So I don't want to do that at this point, but uh, um, I think we've got you know a, a number of strikers in, in the squad that can come in if need to be. Definitely, and obviously you look at the impact that Joe Nuttall had when he first came in, scoring goals mm. and just was able to translate that form. Whether or not the argument can be had, he was at the quality we needed, he still came in and scored goals, um, which is sometimes all you need, just someone that's got that confidence to be in the right place at the right time and, and finish. Jonathan, to, to finish us off, um, do you think we needed a striker? Was it something that you'd have liked to have seen Seen us bring in, or do you echo the, 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 the comments that both Luke and Ryan have made? Yeah, I th- actually think I have said this before on previous podcasts. I, w- I would have kept Danny Graham for another season as a, a, a plan B, those sort of games where you've got your Cardiff centre half, your Stoke centre half, just as a, a, a different option. But equally, I don't think that we should have, I think we've done right in terms of trying to stick by. Bereton and, and Gallagher. I still think there's potentially something there. 
I do think equally Mowbray may reassess that situation in January if we are, are missing that and um, maybe look at a, a short term, a bit of quality, someone to bring us over the line. Like as Ryan said, Glenn Murray was a really good example, talking in a different sort of league, what Man United did a few years ago with Henrik Larsson when they yeah. brought him in. Just that sort of sort of um, know-how, maybe even like there was talk of, though I know this would have never worked with wages, Troy Deeney at Watford. He was rumoured to be leaving. He would have been someone that could have played that sort of role. But no, I think on on the whole we'll be we'll be we'll be okay. And um, I think by the last couple of games, Barrett in the start of the season a lot better. His luck's obviously down with a, in terms of a goal. If you looked at the first four or five games, the Doncaster, the Bournemouth, the Wickham, the the Derby, he could have scored in every one of them. To be fair, um, so I'm. Um, yeah, hoping that he does do it. And, and Gallagher, I still I don't think he's a wide winger, but there's enough that he did in his first period with us when we were a struggling championship side to show that he can actually add value if um, we get the right service to him. And as, as Luke says, it's quite exciting to think any four of six, seven players can make up an attacking quartet. I think, again... I'm gonna say it again. You spot on. Um, it has just got that that they do offer excitement, don't they? And you think there are goals in the squad. So I would agree with with all three of you in saying that. Yeah, would it have been nice to bring in someone like, you know, that like you mentioned a Glenn Murray type player that can just pop up with a goal? Yeah, but was it vital? And could the funds have been better spent elsewhere? One hundred percent. Anyway, that is your lot. I'd obviously like to thank uh, Jonathan, Ryan and Luke for all coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on, guys. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Good Tom. hosting. Yeah, great hosting, Tom. Well, it's, yeah, I, yeah. Honestly, nerve-wracking. Nerve-wracking is something <laughs> like Never get used to it. Um, but no, yeah, thanks again, guys. Obviously, thank you for listening. I would encourage you all to check out um, Ryan's talks on the YouTube channel with um, opposition fans. I would also encourage you to Check out Rovers Chat in general, really. Andy's done some fantastic interviews. It's a stats show as well that I encourage you to check out, as well as everything on the website, articles, player ratings, reports, you name it, we tend to have it. So, like I said, thanks again for joining us, and thanks again to the boys for just sharing their opinion. Bye-bye. Bang, done. How on earth do I stop recording now? I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think if I press stop recording, my world, I always worry then, what if I press stop recording and then deletes? Just down towards the bottom, it should be. There's one you can see it in, left. Might have, might have three dots and then you can click stop recording. Does that save it? <laughs> yeah, when you when you end this and we all leave and the meeting ends, it'll start converting it. Given the length of this meet uh, this meeting, that's going to take ages to convert. Yeah, especially on my girlfriend's Wi-Fi as well. It's a piece of shit. I played foot champs earlier on and like playing on the cool. <laughs> Those videos that I've been doing, they're like twenty minutes long, and it takes like fifteen minutes to convert them. So you're probably going to. I guess there. it's the video as well, isn't it? It's not just the the audio. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll press stop recording and hopefully. There. At least you're on Dan's Zoom, and in theory, he can just log into his Zoom and get the record.